Well, I will go ahead and kick us off. Um, my name is Lydia Guo. I'm a first year MBA student here at the Yale School of Management. Um, thank you everybody in the audience and especially our panelists for being here today. Um, I have the unique privilege of introducing our moderator, Marcus Heyman, um, for this panel focused on racial equity and philanthropy. Um, so quick housekeeping items before I do that. The first is that uh, the Q&A function is over on the right hand side of your screen if you're on the browser version. Um, so please use that and we'll have a uh, 10 minutes at the end of this for Q&A. Um, we'd love to know where you're coming from, so please use the chat and let us know what organization you're with and your title. Um, and then because this panel is focused on racial equity, we'd also just like to understand where folks are coming from. So take a look at the polls in the poll section. Um, and then lastly, we'll have a 30-minute networking session at the end of this panel. Um, I'll post a link to access that session at the end of this um, because there's no better way to kick off your weekend than by continuing this conversation. Um, awesome. So a few words about Marcus Heyman before I hand it off, who has been a wonderful partner in architecting this. Um, Marcus is a partner at Dahlberg Advisors. He co-leads the firm's justice, equity, and economic mobility practice, and has done some great work in this space, specifically around issues of philanthropy and racial equity. He works with funders, nonprofits, government agencies to think through power shifting strategies and practices and embedding racial equity as a priority in an organization. He co-authored the Dahl Dahlberg Report titled Shifting Practices, Sharing Power, How the U.S. Philanthropic Sector is Responding to the 2020 Crises, and the article Shifting Power to Communities in Grant Funding published in the Stanford Social Innovation Review. Prior to Dahlberg, Marcus worked, on, worked at national nonprofits focused on racial justice and economic mobility, including Color of Change and the Local Initiative Support Co Corporation. He's a fellow Yaley, by the way, of Yale College and has a dual MBA MPA from MIT Sloan and Harvard Kennedy. With that, I'd like to extend a personal thanks to Marcus for leading this important discussion, and I will hand it over. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Lydia, uh, for the very warm welcome. Um, one thing I should note before I start is that article you mentioned in Stanford Social Innovation Review was co-written with, with Rodney, actually. So hopefully he can speak to some of those perspectives uh, today. But thank you so much, Lydia, for engaging us um, and looking forward to today's conversation. Um, so it really is, is a pleasure to be with all of you in this, uh, this virtual room to discuss this important topic. Um, and before I introduce the panel and begin today's conversation, I just wanted to take a step back uh, and reflect a bit on, on why we're having this conversation. So nearly two years ago, amidst the raging COVID-19 pandemic, which we know disproportionately affected black and brown communities, um, the racist murder of George Floyd, the, the rise of hate crimes against Asian Americans, which unfortunately continue today, many institutions begin interrogating their role in either combating or perpetuating racism and white supremacy. Um, and against this backdrop, many, many philanthropies made public commitments to invest in racial equity strategies, to address white dominant norms and ways of working in an organizational culture, uh, and to shift power to communities of color. So nearly two years later, we want to revisit those conversations and we want to begin to explore and ask ourselves, like, how well has the philanthropic sector made progress towards these commitments? And we're hoping to discuss some of the challenges and successes that we've seen um, and even really truly interrogate to what end philanthropy is actually built to deliver on many of the promises made. And I think we have the, the perfect set of panelists to do that today. Um, so before I introduce them, uh, Lydia already mentioned some of this. We have about an hour for today's conversation. Um, I'll introduce each of the panelists, um, and then we'll have a, a, a lively, dynamic discussion, hopefully a provocative discussion. Um, and then we'll have some time at the end for questions. And so certainly would encourage you all to ask questions throughout the panel. Uh, we'll do our best to sort of synthesize those and come back at, at the end. Um, and again, thanks in advance for those who have filled out the poll, which helps us to know who's in the audience. Um, so with that, let me introduce our panelists. I'll start with Dr. Shara Reed who is co-executive director at Center for Evaluation and Innovation and director of the Evaluation Roundtable. Uh, and in that role, uh, Cher is chief designer, organizer, and champion of a philanthropic learning and evaluation network that orients around racial equity and justice. Cher came to the center uh, after serving as director of strategic learning, research, and evaluation at the Kresge Foundation, where she guided Kresge to become an intentional learning organization rooted in values of equity and opportunity.
Um, and while there, she also co-led foundation-wide efforts to raise consciousness, consciousness about race uh, and the impact of structural racism on, as the foundation made this commitment to advancing equity. We are also joined by Rodney Foxworth, who is the CEO of Common Future, an organization working to build sustainable, equitable economies that work for all. Uh, Rodney recently founded Invested Impact, a nonprofit consulting firm and intermediary that connects philanthropic and impact investment capital to under, underrepresented social entrepreneurs. He's also served as deputy director of the Warnock Foundation of Venture Philanthropy uh, and is an inaugural Ford Foundation Global Fellow, serves on the board of directors of nonprofit finance fund and race forward and on the steering committee of justice funders. In addition, we are joined by Kabiri Banerjee Murthy, who is chief impact officer at Meyer Memorial Trust and also a member of Meyer's leadership team. Uh, Kabiri brings an illustrious career, illustrious career in philanthropy. So she previously served as vice president of programs of the Brooklyn Community Foundation, program director for education, civic affairs and arts and culture at Crown Family Philanthropies in Chicago, as well as other roles in philanthropy in Boston. She's on the National Board of Neighborhood Funders Group and Philanthropy Northwest, and she is the racial justice co-chair for the Education Funder Strategy Group. So as you all can see, we have panelists who bring a wealth of experience spanning philanthropy and racial equity and really excited to dive into today's conversation. So as I said, we wanna start with a bit of a reflection and a look back. So we know 18 months ago, the US was grappling with national protest. And, and as I said, many foundations made commitments to advance racial equity. And so Shira, I'll start with you. Um, in your view and, and, and your purview of the work you've done, what's your sense of, of how philanthropies are doing against those commitments? And why is that the case? Yeah. <clears throat> well, it's happening live, right? The commitments are happening today. The work is happening live. And for me, I think about, so my background's in higher education before I came into philanthropy. And one of the most seminal books in higher education is The Shape of the River, which is about the long-term consequences of considering race in college admissions. And it's about 20 years of data in that looking at really the formation of the black middle class in the US vis-a-vis -vis the opening of opportunity to people who were qualified but otherwise shut out of higher ed as opportunity. And so in that, I mean, and I sort of take a cue from that and would ask in this generational moment that we are in where philanthropy is making commitments to advance equity and justice, I wonder what will be the shape of our river, right? Is it going to be work that's going to have a short tail? You know, and if you are a statistician or know a little bit about that, what you know then is a little bit of work, short-term, short-term impact. If you go long, you go complex, you go big, guess what? Long-term impact. Um, and so I'd ask, you know, really, what is the shape of the river? Um, and second point is that a lot of philanthropy is really in this work of equipping for transformation. We're hearing a lot of statements, as you said, Marcus, we're seeing dollars beginning to go out the door inside foundations. Many, many people are getting in this place of getting together to show up differently. And we have to do the, both the internal work and the external work. Thank you, Shira. And we're, we're gonna come back to that around the, the internal and the external, because I think oftentimes there's a, a focus on one or the other without thinking through the relationship between both and the need to do both to, to achieve commitments or really to achieve sort of any stated impact. Um, so so on, that, on that note of these, of these commitments and, and what's actually needed, Rodney, let me let me turn to you. So last year, you and Anthony Bug Levine, formerly of Nonprofit Finance Fund, you wrote a piece um, and you highlighted some of the, and we have, I see we have um, an additional additional guest who's also super excited about this topic. Uh, I wants to share their perspective on, on philanthropy and racial equity. Or perhaps not as he's now departed. Um, but but Rodney, you know, you you and Anthony wrote this this article on on some of the the frankly excuses that philanthropies make when it comes to giving to black led organizations, despite the fact that they actually made commitments to do so. 
Uh, talk to us a bit about you know what some of those excuses are, or what the narrative about why it's challenging to actually give to Black-led organizations, and and how might that be influencing or affecting this conversation around upholding commitments? Well, thanks again for inviting me into this conversation, Marcus. I'm glad to have this discussion with everyone on this phenomenal panel, and um, I really would like to speak to that external and internal dynamic that was just raised because oftentimes the way I look at it was that a lot of internalized um, systems that philanthropic institutions and individuals have and as it, as it pertains to why they can't make investments into black organizations, they externalize those internal um, barriers. And what do I mean by that? I effectively think, Marcus, I believe, I find that um, there's sort of like three areas in which uh, philanthropy has historically um, uh, had barriers pertaining to deployment of resources to black organizations. One is the fact that many, not all, but many institutions and individuals don't have proximity nor understanding or relationship to black leaders and organizations and communities. So that's one. Second and related, they don't have a belief and commitment and understanding of the capabilities of, of Black communities and organizations. And the third piece on this, Marcus, is that they don't want to challenge the status quo in which they're existing. And I don't believe those are oftentimes, um, you know, conscious decisions, right? These are just like systemic and institutionalized responses. And so what does it look like then? So for a Black organization, those three things that are internal to philanthropic institutions and foundations and individuals might look like this Black organization doesn't have the capacity to absorb $5 million. This organization, this Black organization might not survive the COVID pandemic because of the financial crisis that it's undergoing. Um, we don't know any Black leaders that are incredible. So it was externalized, all those excuses become externalized onto black organizations and black communities, rather than recognizing the lack of capacity oftentimes that philanthropic uh, leaders and organizations themselves have. And so that is where, I f where we find like the excuses sort of come from Marcus is, is sort of like that, the internal, that internalization that then gets externalized. And it makes it such that you really are hindering the capacities for philanthropic institutions, though, again, as this conversation is playing out, the last couple of years have afforded a much more um, emphatic opportunity for foundations to operate differently. Um, at the same time, historically, that's not always been the case, right? And, that, and that's why we're having these types of conversations today. Um, but what you, what you find is that it really um, diminishes the capabilities and possibilities for black organizations and black communities when philanthropic institutions and individuals do not actually have the, the, the belief and understanding in black communities. And so one of the things that we think a lot about and work on um, and advocate for Marcus as, as do you and others is how do we actually, that the piece that you, that you uh, referenced that I wrote with Anthony, one of the things we pointed out is that the majority of philanthropic decision makers are white and oftentimes white males. Um, and so how do we change that dynamic is one of the things that we think about as well in terms of how we can shift those internalized uh, approaches that did become external, that then sort of put the fault on, we don't, you know, these black organizations don't have the capacity. Um, when really that's a fundamental belief that is um, inherent inside of the institutional approach that the foundation might have versus really acknowledging that um, and, and instead putting that on to black communities. You know, that those are those are common, common themes you've heard. And um, one of the things I'm excited to do is to, in a minute, hear Kaveri's perspective, actually having done this and being able to speak to it. But one quick follow up, because I think for many folks who are, are listening, myself included, when I hear, well, we don't we don't know any <laughs> black load organizations like, well, that is ostensibly part of the mandate to get to know those organizations to, And so I'm just wondering if you can, is that a conversation? Have, have you heard any viable 
rationale for that? Um, and not saying that this necessarily is, but can you speak a bit more about the this proximity? Because I suspect there are a lot of folks who may be saying, well, we really want to. We actually do believe in capacity. It's just that, you know, our pipeline and we don't have the time and et cetera. So maybe just like for, for folks who themselves may be struggling with, we don't know, we're not proximate enough. Speak a bit more about that, if you don't mind. Marcus, I think actually, I mean, philanthropy is is simply to me um, an example of the, the dynamics that we live out in society. And so if, if decision makers and those that are able to make decisions as it pertains to resourcing um, grantees and making investments um, are living their lives in which they're disconnected from black communities. And that's the reality, right? It's that we, there is significant racialized socioeconomic um, segregation, right? And it's, and it's amplified within philanthropic institutions um, and particularly as, as you accrue more and more wealth. And so, I, so one of the things that, to your point about the mandate, and this is where it gets, um, I think really interesting, Marcus, is that there's also, a, there's a significant amount of trust building that has to occur as well. Um, there are a number of, the, the type of work that we do at A Common Future, uh, we're fortunate to have a lot of trusting relationships, but even then, when we've been able to um, create opportunities and partnership with uh, folks in our network, where we're sharing power, um, giving them power, the reality is they've heard so often from institutions and individuals, we will, you know, we will give up power and service to your efforts. So there's a trust building. And so I think part of that is recognizing, again, my, my comment to the to question earlier around really fundamentally shifting the makeup of the decision makers inside of foundations. And I know that's a tough one to really wrestle with, but when I, I've seen organizations, Marcus, where they are their decision makers are folks who have been community organizers that have been doing work embedded on the ground that have these deep lasting relationships. They've been a part of movement building work. They've been a part of racial justice efforts for a number of years. They actually already have those relationships. They already have proximity. <laughs> they have a pipeline already of opportunities in which to resource because they already have those relationships. And so one of the things um, I'll point out, Marcus, is just the opportunity to actually reconsider the types of skills and perspectives and experiences required to do effective, you know, quote unquote, effective philanthropy as well. Helpful. And I definitely appreciate that point of like the who's making decisions. And so Kabiri, really want to want to bring you in of the, the practicalities of this. And so, you know, my understanding, and you can certainly speak to this more, but at my memorial trust, you all have sort of undergone that journey. You also bring a wealth of experience before of having worked with organizations who are trying to do this work. And, you know, in, in the case of Meyer, have developed new community centered grant making programs, which in some respects get at this mm -hmm. racial equity power shifting conversation. So can you talk to us a bit about like what that has actually looked like from the commitment to delivery? What did that process look like? What were the conversations you all were having as you actually were trying to, to execute on what that initial vision may have been? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Marcus. Um, and I'll just pick up on what Sharon Rodney named in terms of the context that we started in. So Meyer was already on its equity journey. Um, it had transitioned from white leadership to leadership of color. Um, I joined in 2018 and it was a, it was an all female um, executive team, a majority uh, women of color executive team and most of the women of color on the team were actually black so it was like a black led foundation which is certainly unusual for our sector we had a you know super diverse staff and our trustees also were um diverse trustee members that came with community experience so there's a little bit of like intentionality that we didn't just stand up justice oregon for black lives you know in the wake of the murder of george floyd and it was like a, it was like a sharp left turn. It was like a, a, a long build towards um, centering equity and being able to really think what that looked like um, and have the foundation on the path to be able to move there. Um, but I will say, you know, especially as Rodney lifts up, like what philanthropy can traditionally look like, certainly the ability to know organizations, um, have lived experience within the executive team and within the trustees and the staff certainly created the conditions for this to be able to come together quickly. So in terms of context, we had a board meeting the Friday after the murder of George Floyd, and we wanted to 
think about what it meant to move with not just words, but with action. And so we went to our board, um, my CEO and I, um, at, with the with the idea of launching Justice Oregon for Black Lives when it was approved. Um, we launched it. It was a five million, twenty five million, five year, sorry, twenty five million dollar commitment um, with an intent to co create this with Black Oregonians. So we didn't want it to be a one time performative grant. We knew we needed to have leadership to be able to um, take the time, build the relationships, deepen the trust, um, to be able to move resources. Um, and we wanted to make sure that we were marrying words with action. And so when we launched Justice Oregon, we also launched it with an initial wave of grants um, to key service providers and organ advocacy organizations within Black community. Um, and so we want, and so hearing that what you can take away is we moved fast and i think the piece to remember here is that like everything comes with some sort of trade-off right so the trade-off for moving fast was that we led with trust we didn't have an application we leaned into relationships with existing partners and we didn't have an open call um, and so we knew that it wasn't a perfect process and we knew that it wasn't a complete reflection of our intentions for the initiative, but it was the way in which we began. Um, so we launched with an initial wave of grants to um, organizations and then we knew that we wanted to make efforts um, and communicate what we would do later, like being able to reach out throughout the state. I mean, to also keep in mind, Oregon was a state that was created to ensure that Black people would not live in the state of Oregon, right? So there's like a very deep historical context for doing this work in this space. Um, as we moved into like from commitment to execution longer term, we hired staff with lived experience who could connect um, and had relationship already built um, with Black Oregonians across the state, be able to develop new ones. And we wanted to make sure that, the, the com that our community partners were actually providing the strategic direction on our priorities for the initiative and the structure for our grant making reflected what was being asked of us for communities. So we, um, it's a little bit of like work that I did at the Brooklyn Community Foundation. We had a super short RFP. We looked at multi-year funding. We actually had video submissions so we could walk away from the supremacy of the written word. So really trying to think about how to lean in to trust-based practices and different ways of operating and be able to really think about what we could do and pilot in our Justice Oregon initiative that might be able to create some ways of us showing up to do our work differently across the board. Um, and so like one of the most important pieces in terms of trust-based philanthropy is we stood up an advisory committee, which is the body that advises us on our goals and our outcomes. And we created a grant review committee made up of the people in our advisory committee, which led the review of the proposals and actually made the recommendations for the funding, which the board approved en masse. Um, so we, um, a couple things to name there is our committee. We do have a couple um, uh, Black philanthropic professionals on the committee, but it is mainly folks from community. Um, we also wanted to make sure that we were uh, providing compensation for wisdom and labor and time. So we played honoraria to everybody who had been involved. We were really intentional about how we thought about the composition of the committee. So we had like young folks on it, um, you know, with their parents um, sometimes, as well as thinking about folks who were um, all across the street. And we moved about $3 million our first year and $5 million this year. And I think the last thing I'll end with is that um, we also realize, and this is to Shara's point of short-term investments, short-term solutions, that our $5 million is the, is the floor and not the ceiling, right? So we went in with a five-year, $25 million commitment saying, like, this is the, this is the entry point, And we want to be able to take the time to listen and learn. But that the intention was to know that all of these structures and systems and challenges were not created in five years and are not going to be taken apart in five years. And so how do we make sure that we are thinking about being able to build something for the long term? Thank you so much. Really, um, the thing that is, there's a lot that that you said, Kaberi, that I think is is really, really resonates with me and hopefully with others as well. And one of the things that like, the themes is like the, the intentionality and also being explicit about what you're trying to do and what you can do and what the trade-offs actually are. And, and that is something that I think both Rodney and Shara spoke about as well, of being really explicit of like, what are you trying to do and, and what are you not trying to do? And certainly 
if you're not able to be clear about what those trade-offs are, if you don't want to do something long-term, if you don't want to address your own internal issues, then you're not going to necessarily have the, the results that you anticipate. And so on this point of being really explicit about what you're trying to do, one of the things that, that many organizations that have, have asked either in closed doors or openly is they've said, you know, well, what do we mean by like racial equity <laughs> or shift power? Like I, I read some articles, like, what, what does that actually mean? What's the, what's the goal here? And so it, certainly it's challenging to try to achieve any commitment if you don't actually know what you're trying to do or, or, or what the end game is. And so Kabiri, maybe I'll stay with you for this question and then hear thoughts from, from Rodney and Shira. Like when it comes to building and shifting power and when it comes to racial equity and like the need to be explicit, what is the end game? Like, what does success at the end of all of this actually looks like as it relates to the work of philanthropy? Well, I'll take a crack at it. I mean, I think in some ways it's like putting ourselves out of business. It's obsolescence, right? We're like aiming for liberation. <laughs> We're aiming for the fact that philanthropy doesn't have to be the, the safety net or the band-aid. It's, it should be that, um, you know, our structures and our systems are whole and working for all of us to be able to thrive. So like, I would say at the end of the day, it's obsolescence. It's that we put ourselves out of a job. Um, and that would be amazing and fabulous because then think about the futures that we're creating for our kids. Um, I think when I think about it, maybe a little bit shorter term, um, I think about it in a couple different ways. I think in some ways around what does it look like to think around process, around shifting power and thinking around equity. And so for me, for us at Meyer, it really means centering the wisdom of BIPOC folk um, and assuming that expertise is not held with like the professional, you know, only with professional staff and that somehow as, you know, the program team, we like magically know everything that needs to be done and we are the holders of power and the recommenders and that the, the um, board knows all. Um, but instead that like the deep wisdom is actually held within community and those who are closest to the challenges have the opportunity and the power and the voice um, that we shine a light on to be able to shape the solutions that are coming um, out of those situations. And so that to me is one big piece of it. I'd also say from like a process standpoint of philanthropy, it's also making sure that we um, we make it not quite so precious and so hard. Um, how do we reduce the burden? How do we streamline the work? How do we get the money out and get out of the way? Um, I, you know, I think a lot around the concept of a net grant, right? Especially if you're doing small amounts of money, how much burden are you putting your grantees through? So if you're doing a $10,000 grant, but you used up $5,000 worth of their time, like your net grant is actually going to be really small. So how do we really think about those pieces of like, what does it look like to reimagine the way in which we do our work? Um, and I think for me at Meyer, there are two pe there are two pieces that I would look at. One piece in terms of um, shifting, uh, in terms of racial equity is, um, is our, our commitment and being able to be really clear about what we're naming. We're not interested in doing being all things to all people. Um, and we are a statewide organization that wants to make sure that there is care for, um, for everyone in our state. And so the way in which we've really named that and the strategy work that I've been leading just um, resulted in our new framework, which is being able to be explicit and clear about where we're trying, how we're trying to do our work. And so we've really named that we're going to use an anti-racist intersectional feminist lens to strengthen movements, change systems, and support communities to build an Oregon that works for all. And so one of the pieces there is really leaning into targeted universalism and being able to center those who are most vulnerable, but realizing that if we are then focused on changing systems, we're actually gonna improve conditions for all. So like being really clear about those pieces of like, we can't do it all. And so like, what are we actually going to do and name and not shying away from being able to lean in to who we're centering and naming racial justice. And then of course, for me, a big piece is words can't be divorced of action. And so then what are our dollars telling us? And so for Meyer, um, a big piece of it has been shifting where our dollars have gone over time um, and being able to really lean into the for us, by us. And so 
um, this year, this fiscal year externally, and we have an April fiscal, so we're just finishing it up. Um, but 45% of our grant making went to BIPOC led organizations and just a little over half went to organizations that are working and centering BIPOC communities. So like when we think about being really clear about where the dollars are going, I think that's a really good way to be able to make sure it's not just in service too, but it's in it's entrusting those who are the leaders of their of our own communities to be the ones who have the resources to show up um, to do the work that is necessary. Thank you. That is, um, it both is is uh, it makes it makes a lot of sense, but it's also really impressive to see how you all at Meyer have put in place specific processes and systems to actually deliver on what that what that vision is. And I. Um, Shira, I want to. I'll ask you a question, building upon this 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 um, this end game that that Kaviri outlined in the context of of Maya, right? Of one aware of obsolescence, but I think importantly of of trust and evolving power. And I and I suppose my my question is from your experience currently at Kresge and otherwise, and it's maybe a provocative question: Is this this end game that we're talking about? This vision, how compatible is that? with the origins and the structure of philanthropy? I mean, no, <laughs> it's a no, it's a hard no. It's easy. <laughs> right? That's easy. It's the unpacking it that's the hard part, right? And putting it back to whatever it's gonna be. So for me, the end game, my dream in this, right? Right now we're talking about philanthropy with a big P, a big, big P like sitting up in the middle of the room, taking up a lot of space relative, right? A lot of space. But philanthropy, right? What the little p is Kabiri, is Rodney, is Marcus, is your cousin, is your neighbor. And so my dream, my end game is about going from the big p to the little p, right? And that's where we're talking, you know, as Kabiri is talking about moving to liberation and moving to reciprocity, right? Um, that's where I want us to go. That's a future that none of us have lived in yet, but we really desperately need to make urgent for far more people, right? Because our lives really do depend on it. The lives of our children depend on it. And we either, you know, we either go up or we go down together at the end of the day. The state of, you know, feeling good about it, it's a temporary thing at the end of the day. We either go up, we go down, we're in it together. And so moving to racial equity, shifting power, they're part of the how. It's part of how we have to move. They're not the whole. Um, they're reforms on a much longer path to transformation. They're the part that we can right now make really tangible, make visible, that have traction and currency and what is still largely big P philanthropy, right? And I wanna add in as well, James Joseph has written about this. He spoke about this to the Council on Foundation some years ago. We need more commitments that are holding the whole of big P philanthropy while we're at it. So we're talking about money and money as the whole. The whole of philanthropy is not that 5% for endowed foundations that are intending to exist in perpetuity. The whole of the whole means the whole of the whole. And so when I worked at the Kresge Foundation and we it took us years to adopt equity as a value, seven years to be exact. There were five values when I started. My first day of work, the values were rolled out. Right before I left, there were six values. I would say, much of my work there was the thing in between going from five to six for equity to get on that table. And it took the whole of the whole organization to see themselves as agents and to see themselves as part of the work. From the grants manager to the chief investment officer to find their way to raise their own consciousness about race in an intersectional way to see why racial equity really had to be at the center of their efforts. So, you know, it's a it's a hard no for me on is the end game compatible with the origins and the structure. And I do see the work of the whole of 
philanthropy big P, everybody's got to get on board. We have got to be on board if we're going to move um, toward this future. Um, and I think part of what happens as we go, Rodney was talking about proximity, right? Kabiri proximity. Part of what happens, and we saw this at the Kresge Foundation, part of what happens when you get everybody, regardless of their role, wherever they sit in a hierarchical organization, regardless if they ever touch the grant making stewardship as, um, as the advocates for any particular grant or body of work, when you start doing this work, you start to change a bit. It calls up your whole person. You actually become more proximate regardless and of your identities. They come to the table, you bring more of who you are. The distance between the folks inside the foundations who are employed and the distance in, the, in those who are working in nonprofit organizations, those who are in movement and so on, it starts to narrow because people come start to show up as more of who they are. And so we need everybody who is working in philanthropic BP organizations to learn how to show up, how to close that distance, boards, you know, included. We need to go beyond like a five, you know, right now we're working in 5% solutions. If you're operating in perpetuity, people talk about 10% solutions and, you know, you do the little thing and it's enough and you get, well, no, not, not when we're talking about black lives, brown lives, indigenous lives, lives of people who are trans, lives of people who have disabilities. 5% solutions and asking people to do all the work with 5% solution money is never going to get us to that end game. So we are not organized right now. Philanthropy Big P is not organized for that end game, for little P philanthropy to really come forward. But the work of shifting power, of getting proximate, getting the whole organization on board is absolutely critical in how these reforms are going to happen so that transformation will be real. Sure. Um, I want to pick up on that. And, and as we sort of transition to the third topic that we're going to hope to cover um, in today's panel before shifting to Q&A. And it's a it's a point that that Rodney brought up at the outset of this, this internal external. And so before I, I ask a question to Rodney, I just want to um, encourage participants, uh, please do feel free to begin to put questions uh, in via the chat function. We're, we'll reserve some time at the end, but as questions arise of anything that's been said or things you want to hear from our, our panelists, please do put those in. Um, but Rodney, uh, picking up on on the the proximity point that that Shira made and and what you said before, I think a lot of this conversation is around what philanthropies, what foundations need to do, and and their own internal processes and and particularly for organizations that are not as proximate to organizations doing this work, they may also say, you know, well, we don't actually really know what they need or, or what the ask is. And I recognize, you know, when I think about common future, I think about an organization that is fundamentally trying to change the system and change how folks operate. And so this is a, a, a big question because I recognize you all have national purview, but what are some of the, the, the themes of like organizations, of what do organizations say they need and want, right? For for those philanthropies, foundations that may not be as proximate and may say, well, I don't actually know what the ask is. What is the what is the ask? What what should foundations be doing differently from the perspective of organizations who are doing this work on the ground? Well, thanks for the question, Marcus. And are, can you hear me? Sorry, because I, I think it went out for a little minute. Okay. Loud and clear. Um, so one, I just wanted to relate with all the comments that were just uh, shared, plus 1,000. Um, it was like, you know, I mean, it was like mic drops. I was almost like, Marcus, just get to Q&A. We don't need to have any more conversation at this point. <laughs> it was all said. Um, so thanks for having me have to respond now. Um, but uh <laughs> um, yeah, I, I try to. I think simply, and in, in, in this was just this was already pointed out that you know that narrowing that that distance and recognizing the humanity, um, and, and and the possibility and capabilities of folks on the ground. At the end of the day, I think 
just that appreciation and recognition because Marcus, I feel as though when I hear these questions myself often, all the, I mean, quite often about what's actually to ask, you know, paint me the picture, all these sort of things. Quite frankly, Marcus, that is yet another way of holding power, right? I mean, it's, it's actually, you know, why do um, black, brown, indigenous folks have to, you know, um, demonstrate and portray the narrative and the story that might click uh, for someone to understand. And at the end of the day, I actually feel, I, I understand that when, in conversations repeatedly, it gets simplified, Marcus. It's like folks want to be seen, right? They want to be seen in the work. They want to be seen as people. From a material and transactional perspective, they want mature, like uh, substantial resources that actually will allow them you know, not the 5% solution, not the 10%, they want the 100% solution um, for what it will take to build in their communities and their places in the ways that are liberating. And, 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 and so I, when I hear that question of what is the ask, most of the time, I think people know what the ask is. The question <laughs> is what are the barriers to delivering on that ask, right? Are you able to, get outside of that 5%, 10%, you know, solution bucket. Um, do you have the, the, does your, interest, again, you know, capital P philanthropy, right? <laughs> um, do you have, do you have capabilities and, and opportunity to be able to do that? Um, but that's, that's it. I mean, that, to, to try to make it as simple as possible, Marcus, right? And, you know, folks want to have agency that is resourced. They want to have, they want to be seen. They want to see their efforts are invested in. Um, it's interesting because the, the one thing I'll say on this point is I, I, I find it fast. The last thing I'll say on this is that um, it's really interesting the type of decision that you're able to make with so little information when there is fundamental belief in the people and communities, right? And I say that again, going back to my whole point of like wanting to be seen, wanting to be heard, wanting to just be invested in and recognized on, the huma on a human level. And that's that's much more than like the the technocratic practice of you know um, you know large P philanthropy. It's just to be seen because once you have that, I think that's what really makes it for organizations like Common Future. When we have folks that have particular excessive experiences, when during the, the well, throughout the pandemic, but particularly at the beginning of the pandemic, when you you have family members that are frontline workers, right? We have family members that can't you know aren't aren't fortunate enough to be able to. Um, um, work from home and and all those sorts of things. And it's on the top of your mind. It's it's you wear it, and so you can make decisions and understand and see people in a different type of way. And so I think that is is, is such a significant piece of it, Marcus. Being seen, being heard, being respected, being seen as humans, and materially investing in the work, having non-restrictive resources available um, uh, to support the work. That for, that for that real talk, Rodney, which I think is, it is at the end of the day, a lot of just seeing the humanity in individuals, right? And recognizing that there are things that people do and, and experience that they have that you may not have. And rather than sort of expecting someone to justify or substantiate for you, finding a way in a position of power to to get out of that that mindset. And so that, that definitely resonates. And I think it's it's one thing like, everyone can do. And so I'll, I'll, I'll ask my final question and, and sort of full transparency for the participants. We were, we're doing a prep call and we discussed, you know, oftentimes when we get into these conversations, there's a risk of, oh, you know, I can't do this at my organization or I tried and this person said no and et cetera, et cetera. And that may very well be the case. But I think each of us would also agree that there's something everyone can do. And certainly part of it is seeing, hearing, listening, getting more proximate. But maybe before we, we close out the discussion and shift to questions, I'll ask each panelist um, that one, one question, which is, what is one thing that all participants can do, not tomorrow because it's Saturday, but they can do on Tuesday after the long weekend to actually advance this work, right? If there's one thing that everyone can feel empowered to do and has agency to do, what might it be? Um, Kabiri, I'll, I'll start with you and then go to Rodney and then have Shira close us out. Um, I think the thing I would say, you know, 
and, and Shara alluded to this at Kresge, you know, like the seven years to get there, Meyer was on its journey when we started. So these are these are not things that happen overnight, right? So I just want to say like, you know, the the end go, the, the, the place that we're at now, which isn't even the end, isn't even the aspiration, but is still continual, continual journey on the way. Um, it started a long time ago. Um, and, and so I would say also, so, so knowing that I would say, um, don't assume that you need to change your organization all at once. This isn't an all or nothing game, right? This isn't all about like, how do you be the best? How do you be the most, you know, like, how do you do it all, all at once? Um, and also like, how do you do it in a way where you accept that you will make mistakes and we need to walk away from the sense of perfectionism and that like the fear of getting it wrong shouldn't be the thing that keeps you from trying to be able to do it. And so Justice Oregon in some ways was like a really important piece for us. We were able to um, lean into participatory grant making in a really deep and authentic way. We were able to uncover what are the pain points that exist within our own organization? What does it look like to be able to provide honoraria for folks who may not have bank accounts, right? So there were like systemic pieces that we now are aware that we need to tackle if we're actually gonna lean in deeper and harder to do this more, right? So instead of saying like, we're gonna get all our ducks in a row, we're gonna get it perfect and it's gonna be beautiful, let that go and just say like, we're gonna try it here and we're gonna learn something and we're gonna get something wrong and hopefully we're not gonna cause a ton of harm and we want people to be with us and it's in the doing of the work that the relationship and the proximity actually develops authentically. And so how do we build that relationship? How do we build that trust? And how do we also offer like the clarity and the guardrails of like, this is on the table and this is not on the table. So like, let's be really real about what it's what we're able to do at this moment while we also name a future state that we aspire to get to. But like, you don't get there overnight. So don't set yourself up for thinking that it's gonna magically happen in like a heartbeat. Thanks, Kaviri, fully understood. Rodney? What's the, the one thing you think individuals can do as they're trying to advance this work in their organizations? Yeah, it's such a it's such a great question, Marcus, because quite frankly, in my experience, um, it does start with an individual and individuals inside of institutions. Um, and I say that without, you know, wanting to put so much of, of responsibility and accountability on folks who within their own organizations might not have um, the most power. Right. Um, but I do see that change has happened in my own experiences that kind of mentioned previously, how one individual begins to coalesce, organize with another individual. And there's this sort of this effort to shift culture, and even if it's one thing, right, to what Kaberi is pointing out. Maybe it's, you, you know what, you, only, you have within your span of control an opportunity to do one singular thing, a grants program that um, you can build on top of, right? Um, but it's an opportunity for others in the institution to actually learn from it. And it could be kind of sort of an advocacy platform. And so I think of, of, of sort of like, what are those opportunities that you may have? I mean, whether you're in, you're on the accountancy side of it, you know, are there ways that you can think about the way that your organization um, is considering, you know, the diligence process? Like, what are the things that you're asking for? Are these things that you really require like, are they, are they really required or are there things that have been layered on top of and can you advocate for a change there, right? I mean, we know so often is asking for three years of audited financials for a lot of institutions is, is, a, is, is, a, is a significant ask, right? And, and so are there sort of things that can be shifted there? And so find if there's, if there's someone else inside of your organization that you could um, coalition with that you can build some some alignment to help to advance even one thing that is in service to racial justice inside of the institution. Thanks so much, Rodney. Shira, why don't you close us out? What do you think is one thing folks can do? Yeah, it's show up, be in community. So some of you all would have saw my seven-year-old son make his appearance, right? And he fuels, he and my, my younger son fuel a lot of my commitment and one of the things we're doing is we're learning about the civil rights movement. So teaching my son about the civil rights movement. So I'll use the example of the Montgomery bus boycott. Do you know how many days the Montgomery bus boycott went on? 367, it was longer than a year. 
and people didn't have money to get in an Uber and there was no Uber. So how were people aching tired feet getting to and from work and people did not have the option to take PTO, right? There were no leaves of absence and people kept doing it and kept showing up. We have really strong historic examples, one of what it takes, right? To really advance racial equity or have in this case, basic human rights guaranteed and shift power. And the bus company went out of business. We know that, right? You may have learned that in your history books or not. And what did it take? People had to show up and they did not show up alone. They were in community. So my one thing is show up, be in community, find people who can carry water with you. And I say this in particular to people who are the only one in their organization, however you hear that. Find some people who can carry some water with you because it will allow you to be bolder tomorrow than you can be today. Thank you all so much. And I, I think this point of managing expectations and knowing that you have some degree of agency and showing up to this work authentically is so critical. And it is really more about the, it's both the what you do, but also importantly, how, how you do it and, and how you choose to orient towards your work beginning Monday morning, Tuesday morning. Um, so we, I, I had grand ambitions for a lot more time for questions and Kaveri was like, this is, it's a bit too ambitious, Marcus, but we're gonna, we're gonna go with a question um, that I think is really interesting since we've been talking about philanthropy. And there are a few questions here about other types of investment. And so I'll sort of try to, to paraphrase a bit, but uh, one question from Daniel Harris says, I'm curious what the panelists envision as the ideal relationship between philanthropic capital and sources of sustainable borrowing for communities that have, ex have been traditionally excluded from the traditional financial system. Um, and there's also sort of a question here around what is the role of like impact investors in this conversation? And so maybe I would be great if, if we can maybe try to combine those two. Would love if the panelists could speak to, if you have a perspective on, you know, others who have capital outside of philanthropy who may be on the line, what might be their, might, what might be their role? And feel free, any either of you to, to come off of, of mute. I see you all nodding, so you all may have a perspective, but I would love to hear from each of you if you have a thoughts here. Just quickly, uh, Marcus, um, I think particularly in a, um, I'm going to limit it to, because impact investing is coming out of the foundation world, so I'm going to limit it there um, for this. Um, we point out that the 5% solution, we need to get to 100% solution. And one of the things that um, a lot of foundations, I'd say the majority of foundations um, are, are a bit guilty of is not aligning their investment capital with their grant capital, which is very clear. Um, and <clears throat> there's an opportunity and, and what you see is sort of like a, a oftentimes a segmentation of sort of the investing side of the house where it's really about not just perpetuity, but almost, I mean, it is significantly about perpetuity I mean, oftentimes um, the investment house side of it is 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 even elevated above the mission work of um, that's happening inside of these institutions. And so, one thing I would say to philanthropic in terms of investing, impact investing, is really a fundamentally aligning your entire set of capital in such ways that it's about building perpetual wealth in communities and not about your own perpetuity. And that requires a different set of skills than are you oftentimes find embedded in mindsets that you find embedded in the in the in the, in the investment side of those institutions. I'm happy to jump in as well and add this. So one, I want to give a shout out to Linux Park Solutions. Uh, Linux Park Solutions, led by Jason Lemon, is doing really incredible work around inclusion and who are our asset managers and philanthropic organizations as part of a gateway into a broader conversation about just what Rodney is talking about, right? Where is the money going? Who is it serving? Who is it protecting? So we do need all forms of capital uh, in all in here if we're gonna get to 100% solutions. Uh, I think that there are also some really promising examples of what some foundations are doing 
when they where they are combining grant making and impact or social investing was a really big part of the work that's happening at the Kresge Foundation, which is what I'm most familiar with. It's certainly not the only place where that's happening. Um, and in that work, I know we were always looking at one, really asking ourselves hard questions about where can grant dollars go that no other kind of financial money dollars can go? What can grant dollars do distinctly? And then how, do, how might grant dollars actually set the stage, prepare for a larger impact or social investment, right? And so what is that combination? If one plus one is greater than two, how do we make that possible? That was the, the equation that we were deep in um, during my time at Kresge. And certainly, again, there are many other foundations that are doing work in impact investing and really thinking about blended models um, for how uh, financial capital goes out the door, as well as really fundamentally questioning their investment, uh, their, mis their mission related investment strategies and that 95%. Thank you, Shira. Um, we have time for one more question. It is a biggie, but we would be, I'd be remiss if we didn't raise this because this work can be, we know this work can disproportionately fall on folks of color in these organizations. Um, and I think, you know, we all discuss that as, as four individuals of color on this panel. And so there's a question of how, um, how best should foundations be lifting up their staff and leaders of color and leveraging their lived experiences without exhausting them? Um, I know that this is a big question to tackle in a minute or two, but any quick thoughts we might have? Kabiri, why don't we start with you? Well, I think this is really real at all levels. I say this as like, you know, someone who was like a young upstart <laughs> in pretty white institutions and then also leading with other folks of color um, at a large institution. But one of the things I would really one of the things I think about a lot is like, how do we make sure that we set our leaders up for success, especially and, and our, our staffs of color up for success, regardless of where they fall within an org chart. Um, and so there's a, and I would say like, we're coming in a moment where there's a lot of interest in being able to have people of color lead and it's coming at a really tough moment, right? And so I, for anybody who's interested, I'd lift up the um, report I think it's called trading glass glass ceilings for glass cliffs. I think I got that right. Um, and if someone can drop it in the chat, that would be amazing. But I just think that there is a moment of, um, regardless of where you are in the organization, and I say this as someone who thought it might be easier as so I got higher up within an org chart to be able to um, have positional power and authority to be able to make things happen. Um, these structures are created to work exactly how they're supposed to work. Um, and nobody can be the unicorn, right? So it's not about an individual. It really is thinking about what's the individual, what's the interpersonal, what's the organizational, what's the institutional, um, and how do we make sure that we are um, aware of all of those factors and looking at what our organizations and our structures need to hold in order to position folks for success. Thank you so much, Kaveri. And I, I think the, the point that we discussed before um, that really stayed with me is unfortunately, like given these structures, there's risk at all levels. And so it is easy to look at someone else and say, well, this is a person of color in this position of leadership, but in racist white supremacist structures, there is always some degree of risk, whether it's from your boss, your board, your funders, and et cetera. And so part of, I think this conversation needs to be also acknowledging that, that there is a question very much fundamentally of like, at what cost can we expect leaders of color to do this work? And what is the role of everyone in actually shepherding and changing these systems, both internally and externally? Um, we are at 4.59 Eastern, and um, we're gonna wrap up here. I know that folks are either perhaps headed for a weekend or even another meeting they have to lead. And so with that, number one, thank you so, so much for to our panelists for this rich, candid, open conversation. A special thank you to Lydia Guo, who organized this panel and works tirelessly along with other members of the Yale Philanthropy Conference. Um, and thank you to all of you for, for joining and participating in this conversation. I know we couldn't get to all your questions, but I'm hoping that you each took away with that point of there's something we can all do 
beginning Tuesday morning. If you have a long week and Monday morning not, there's something we can all do. We all have some degree of agency in trying to shift the way that philanthropy currently works. So with that, thank you all very much um, and have a wonderful weekend.